Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to participants and friends in the room and uh, virtual participants. We have a lot of signups coming online. But uh, again, my name is uh, Krishna Mohan. I am the president of uh, San Francisco Bay Area Alumni Chapter of Carnegie Mellon. Uh, uh, and uh, it's a pleasure to invite our guests from VMware, from Cisco, and all of you uh, to this event. Uh, we did some changes. Normally, we do it at 6.30, but we were trying to manage the traffic and other things. Uh, uh, so I, I know a lot of people will check in later on. Uh, but uh, before we start, I would request uh, Bob to speak a few words about the campus here, and then uh, we'll make other introductions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Krishna, and, and welcome to everybody. We're very pleased to have you here. Uh, we love to show off the campus. We love to bring uh, thought leaders together. We love to have challenging topics uh, to, to, to come before us. Uh, and our distinguished guest, who we'll introduce in just a minute, uh, is going to be talking about virtualization and VMware, both of which have sort of, sort of become a force of nature in our technology climate today. So I think it's very opportune that we have this place where we like to talk about great ideas and, and great speakers who can bring challenging, challenging ideas and perspectives. Uh, we are a growing campus. We are uh, we are uh, thriving in uh, in the midst of Silicon Valley. We like to be the creative collision between Silicon Valley and uh, Carnegie Mellon University, uh, broadly. So we're glad to have you here. We hope we have we know we'll have a wonderful conversation. Uh, welcome to all of you who are uh, online. So Krishna, where'd you go? You're going to do our official introduction uh, of our speaker. Please. Thanks, Bob. Uh, just to give a preview of uh, what we do, I mean, there are about, as uh, Dr. Evans was mentioning, we are about 6,000 uh, CMU alumni in the Bay Area. Uh, and compared to other areas, it's what second largest to Pittsburgh, I was told. But uh, with respect to the importance, it's uh, very disproportionate. Half the board of trustees are from here. And uh, for us, it's, uh, it's a rare opportunity that uh, we have, we could discuss with uh, great folks uh, across the table, like, uh, we had Eric Schmidt, and we had Apple at uh, uh, Frank, and we had uh, Ray Lane in a room advising and getting through, uh, plus contributing immensely. One of this is that last year, uh, as the chapter helped raise a billion dollar, and it's still increasing in terms of value. Uh, plus, we also contributed one of the chapters where we contributed to selecting our president, Dr. Suresh, again, who was at NSF, is, is our president now, and he's had a very ambitious plan of increasing the footprint of already strong uh, CS branch to and robotics to other areas. Uh, you could have seen about the big uh, uh, checks being cut by Tepper uh, to make the quad much more entrepreneurial and collaborative. The chapter itself is based on uh, three principles. One of them is uh, uh, collaboration. Now, on that, uh, we were not necessarily collaborating within the different chapters or different schools of Carnegie Mellon, but we reached out to Cornell with Stanford with Harvard, with uh, MIT, Kellogg. So Silicon Valley, we are blessed with so much of, uh, uh, we are lucky to come from uh, stellar schools, but the importance is to extend and see what we can do uh, to create and break barriers to change the world and improve it for the better. Uh, the activities are technology related. We had uh, huge big data events done here in the NASA complex. We have great events like this where we are extending the conversations from just knowledge transfer to getting inspired, which is the second theme. Uh, Jan was mentioning about the story elements of it. All of us are smart and maybe more than a lot of others, uh, but what connects with us is what each of us uh, go through life and what inspires us, and how we get motivated. So this series is to talk about and understand what makes Sanjay and other uh, speakers what they are and how we can learn and improve from what we are doing it. And uh, that this I'd seen uh, uh, was a recurring theme with uh, global <coughs> connections. We had, uh, for several events, people waking up in India, China, uh, middle of a work in Japan, trying to log in and do it. Today, we have uh, folks from Florida logging in, Pittsburgh, New York, So and as close as San Francisco, we're looking at the traffic here. So <laughs> it doesn't get any better, that's for sure. They're watching in their car. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So, Thanks again to we'll all of you for coming. Technology for that. A quick introduction. <clears throat> I had a tough time in trying to trim down both the bios of our uh, fireside chat uh, honorary attendees. Uh, it's too long. So I, we've uh, trimmed it 
but in the pos due to paucity of time, I'll make it even uh, shorter. Uh, that's a difficult task. But uh, Sanjay, uh, again, thank you for taking time off. We know it's very tight schedule. We are stopping at 6.45 or so. And uh, he is uh, the Executive Vice President and General Manager of End-User Computing, VMware. Uh, he uh, heads uh, quite a bit of activity. And uh, after AirWatch, the strength of the team is plus 2,000 or more in terms of uh, the numbers. Uh, but in terms of significance, I'm sure it, it's going to be even more. We heard about his collaborations with Google, with uh, several other Valley icons. Uh, and we are sure we'll see many more. Uh, Sanjay, before this, was uh, president of uh, SAP, uh, a very large group. And uh, he was instrumental in probably transferring uh, the platform solutions. Uh, and he managed uh, the analytics and databases, uh, big data mobility, to increase significant revenues for SAP. Uh, again, uh, he is, uh, again, from uh, great schools, uh, Harvard for his MBA, uh, Dartmouth for his MS, and uh, Stanford for his, again, MS. So, Thank you again for joining us. Uh, Dr. Evans, quite a few of us had heard him, been taught by him. Uh, no words are too long. I let uh, uh, Dr. Evans talk too. And uh, thank you again for virtual and uh, physical participants. Please enjoy. After this, we'll walk across to our friends for light refreshments and uh, chats. Thank you again. Thank you, Sanjay. That's very kind of you. And Bob, thank you for the introduction. And Sanjay, welcome here today. It's a great thank privilege. You, to, great to and, be here. And, and, Thank you all for coming today, too. It's, uh, it's a great topic. And as, as Krishna said, you have quite a, a varied background. And I, I, I'm intrigued by how the difference between SAP and, and, and VMware and Apple and all that kind of work together because they're the most innovative companies on the planet right now. And, and you've been heavily involved in, in all of that. But I understand you came from, from India a while ago. And, and, and you arrived in, in, in the U.S. with about $10 and have made a career from, from scratch there. Perhaps you could tell us a little bit about your background and how you came to, to the yeah, U.S. Yeah, and you know, i, I got to tell you a little bit of a funny story in this connection. Uh, when I, uh, as many of you who are Indians here are from first-generation immigrants, uh, you hear a lot about what these fantastic universities are. Um, and most, you know, most uh, of us in India sort of go through two roads to life. Not to say that there are only two roads to life, but you typically... <laughs> You know, come out and you're told you either got to be an engineer or a doctor. So you, you know, either really good at the math gene or you're good at the biology <laughs> gene, right? And my mom From was a doctor. Age. My mom was a doctor. I didn't have that gene. My math. My dad was in the navy and had a more of a math gene. So anyway, so I aspired to be an engineer or a computer scientist. And um, you know, at um, um, at the end of the twelfth grade, um, you know, all most of the folks who have that desire apply to these engineering institutions. IIT is the one that's in, and I applied there, did the entrance exam, and I think I was ranked in the 200s. Um, and I really wanted to do computer science, but I got electrical engineering. Not that that's bad, and all of you are electrical Bro, engineers. Are, East, are, East, you know, we were on, but, but I wanted to do computer science. Computer science was like the thing in the, in the, the 80s. The rivalry between ECE and computer science I mean, science you know, is it's strong. They're both good, but computer science. That was like what I wanted to do, and I didn't get ranked high enough. You know, I think the top 50 get computer science, and I was wow. ranked 200 or whatever have you. So at the same time, my, my uncle, who happens to live in the States, um, said, hey, you ought to apply to a few universities in the US, because they're offering scholarships. It's usually rare. Most of you are Indians know that most Indians come here in, in the master's uh, level after having done a, an undergrad. So I said, that's no problem. I'll try it out. I've not been here. And, yeah, yeah. Um, and I applied to four schools. I applied to MIT, because you know, I wanted to be in tech, Caltech, Carnegie Mellon, that you know, was world famous for computer science, and then like Dartmouth was my backup. You know, oh, I well. didn't get into Carnegie Mellon or George Dartmouth or something of that kind. So I didn't get into the first three. You know, I didn't get into MIT. I didn't get into Caltech. I didn't get into Carnegie Mellon, but I got into Dartmouth. And the story is I went to, to Dartmouth with, and landed. So I can actually now finally say I'm at Carnegie Mellon. <laughs> I'm so excited. Well, welcome to Carnegie Mellon. Thank you Mellon, for everybody. welcoming me. I can tell my mom I finally got into Carnegie Mellon. Well, right. we hope so you'll be a frequent visitor because we really so would enjoy that you, you know, it's, finally uh, saw me worthy you know, yeah. to be on your campus. <laughs> It took, you know, decades, but, you know, I'm happy to be here. Well, we're very pleased to hear, and we're, it, it, it's, it's interesting, because I, I know the IIT exams are probably much more excruciating than anything that we ever do here in Well, SAT you got to tell that stuff. to the Carnegie Mellon undergrad <laughs> group who, like, rejected me, but nonetheless, no, it's a, it is a, I think it's a, it's a good training curriculum, and I think it's one of the things that, we, you know, uh, I hope we can continue, you know, the, the college education system in the United States is the envy of the world. 
Carnegie Mellon, they're all the great universities. And I think it's uh, getting better. It is, absolutely. But we've got to get the school system to also be at that same level, right? I think part of the reason it sure. prepared me, uh, you know, to place into sure. third year level almost uh, math and physics yeah. when I joined was just the great preparation of uh, the yeah. Indian school system. And, and I just think about our kids and what they need yeah. uh, to really step up to the university system. It's just harder in public schools. Many people do private yeah. schools or additional. That's yeah. really what we got to No, I agree. And they're taking away AP exams and things like that. And, and fewer students are doing them. And I think the future depends, as we see in Silicon Valley. Absolutely. It's like the Olympiads for, for, for people with a brain. Yeah. Uh, and it's a delight to see people moving in here. But we need to produce more. Absolutely. And if the way the world is going, it, 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 it's certainly that, that, that's the case. But so when you, when you came to Dartmouth, uh, what did you do after Dartmouth? Where did you go to I Dartmouth? took a year off between my junior and my senior year. Uh, they encouraged that. It was not quite a year. It was about nine months. Yeah. Um, and I went to uh, this little small company in, in Seattle called Microsoft. Uh, at the time, it was relatively small. Uh, and, uh, you know, I was just so excited because, you know, as people have heard about Bill Gates and uh, so I did sort of what was a longer summer internship um, and loved it. It was absolutely, it was 1990 and oh, wow. it was Windows uh, was uh, was just coming out, Windows, yeah. uh, you know, and the company I think was about 2,000 people. And uh, Gates used to do a, a summer holiday uh, sort of get together for all the interns. Okay? So I've never yeah. met Gates since yeah. 1990, <laughs> never seen him, never shook his hand, but I saw him, like came within five feet of him. Oh. And there was this tradition apparently that you know the interns tried to push Gates in the pool. His pool. This was not his <laughs> new house; it was the old house. It didn't really happen, but nonetheless, I mean, it was it just was a new. smaller uh, company at the time. And uh, you know, I I just learned a lot during that, yeah, that yeah, summertime. Yeah. Uh, went back, finished my senior year, and then came out to Silicon Valley to to come to Apple. And you know, I used a Macintosh because uh, there's so many Macs. I mean, uh, Dartmouth has just proliferated. We sort of adopted Apple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These were the wilderness years of Steve Jobs. I was going to say, before Steve 95, came back, yeah. But his legacy <clears throat> is just still there. He was at Next at the time. Uh, but, you know, Spindler and, and all Yeah, he had all those wilderness years. I mean, he still had a lot of the legacy of, of, of Steve's footprint yeah. uh, at Apple. I learned a ton there the next four years. So that was, you know, my entry to Silicon Valley in You know, it, it's really interesting you make that point about going to Microsoft at that time because, you know, one of the things we do in our classes is, is talk about entrepreneurship and innovation. And I think it's a great idea for people to see firsthand what a high growth environment is like. And Microsoft was clearly going through that explosive growth phase at, the, at that point. Did you, you learn anything? I mean, you did your, your, your MBA at Harvard, so you have a, a great exposure. Did they teach you anything at Harvard that you, you, you kind of didn't pick up at Microsoft going through that environment? I mean, you got to understand in your 20s, you're just young and raw, and you're just, I mean, I'm the youngest. I mean, all I was doing, it, whether it was Microsoft or Apple, was just like looking up to these people who were like gods <laughs> and programming and like teach me how to write better code, right? Uh, so if you had a code review with these people who you heard were legends, you just like prepared for it like days and weeks in advance to like know they were going to pick apart some line of code that you wrote that yeah. was not optimized for whatever reason, right? So, you know, at that stage, you're just so impressionable and you just wanted to learn. Yeah. Um, I think you just, you know, watched a lot of, of, you know, great product managers. I think Microsoft, I mean, still does, but those early days, you know, people like Jeff Rakes, who, you know, ran Office, yeah. incredible person. I got to know him a little better after that. But, you know, just some of the things that I watched him do with the, the way in which, you know, he was making some of the decisions, those were the early years of his ascendancy and career, mm -hmm. uh, many of the early product managers and engineers that were in, in the, what but is now Office, Word, Excel. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, but, you know, and similarly to Apple, Apple had, you know, I think the roots of it are many, many great product managers. So, you know, I think these, the, the sort of core of any great software company, any innovation are, you know, kind of these engineers and product managers that magically are able to work right next to each other. Yeah, and yeah, just yeah. build beautiful product, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was just story after story. I'll just say a few of them. Um, uh, this one, you know, apparently wasn't actually my group, but you know, I think it was the group upstairs, the the, the Microsoft Word group. Um, you know, the product manager was sitting next to the engineer, and the engineer used to walk, watch this product manager like walking 50 yards, <laughs> you know, uh, every few hours to paste back and bring a piece of paper. And he's like, "What are you doing?" He's like, "Well, I was just trying to figure out what this 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 thing would look like when it was printed out." The next morning, the engineer uh, implemented print preview. Yeah. It's like, well, wow. I didn't know that's what you wanted, right? So the power of getting like an engineer next to a product manager, the engineer's like, wow, okay, is that what you want? 
it's sort of getting that voice of the customer really close to it. And yeah. there were just so many examples of that uh, that for me were very, very, very formative. That by the point I actually went to business school, um, um, you know, I'd seen so many of those things that I was very inspired by, uh, you know, what that combination of a great product management. Mm -hmm. Today, I think the Silicon Valley, we have a lot of very good engineers, but we don't have a lot of very good product managers. Yes, and that's absolutely. probably the one skill. If, you know, I have a passion to help build stronger, those are the people who are the future Steve Jobs. Yeah. And they're the folks who are really at the, at the connection of a customer, yeah. sort of a salesperson. <clears throat> Uh, and the engineer, they have to bring it all together. Yeah, yeah, but in a traditional kind of organizational structure, they fall right in the middle. I mean, yes, they do have to make that, but they tend to give bounce from sales back to engineer and back to marketing, and then they're not quite sure where they fit. And it's really hard to train a product manager from somebody that's come in that's not done it before. But it's an essential skill. You know, I mean, I didn't start. I started as an engineer. And, you know, somewhere along the line, I think in you know three or four years into Apple spun out this this effort that didn't go well, which is part of the reason I left and went back to business school um, uh, with IBM called Taligent. So yeah, you don't yeah. want to say you're from Taligent. You want to say you're from Apple. Yeah. Right? It well, it did, didn't they do that with that guy from, uh, from Macromedia? Uh, you uh, um, yeah, there were a few folks. In fact, Mo Motorola, uh, yeah. one who went for Motorola, because they only ran it to the end of it. But, um, you know, Taligent had some of the best engineers um, there. I just found at the sort of the three or four-year mark, one of the things... I was getting asked to do was do a demo, okay? And, uh, you know, it's just a little bit of a God-given gift. I have a reasonable good gift at communication. And because I'm an engineer, if the product didn't work, I could actually code and <laughs> fix it the night before, right? It's not one of those things which, you know, so... But communication skills was very important. very important. And I found that, that, wow, all of a sudden I was getting calls from these uh, marketeers and sales guys to do a demo. And right. I liked being in front of customers. Yeah, now, yeah. But I was just an engineer. I was not a product manager. Um, and because of my technical knowledge, I actually was able to be more conversant about the details. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I just think so everybody here is an engineer. Uh, I think the most important thing is to stay really close to the technology. Uh, often what happens to that product manager is they start becoming yeah, sort of yeah, marketing yeah. savvy uh, and so on, and then they lose their technical chops, right? Yeah. So you think software engineers make really good product managers? I think they do, and it's, it's a really good thing to have because without the knowledge of the software, you can't really get I think that, yeah, it's a re I, I personally think that, you know, an engineering basis for that is probably the right route. And then you have to decide. It's not that every engineer needs to become a product manager, but if you feel like you enjoy uh, being in front of a customer, you enjoy this, exactly, this sort of Brownian motion chaos yeah, yeah, yeah. of getting pulled on one side from sales and pulled on the other side from engineers, being trampled on from both sides, okay, not really bad. But at the end of this, that's a polite, actually, way, that's a polite way. That's not. I mean, yeah. a lot of product managers, their life feels like crap, right? Yeah. Because they're yeah. getting pulled on one side, pulled on the other side, and they, you know, are trying to make it all happen. Yeah. But when you make it happen, you have this sort of sense of like, wow, you know, we brought something together. When you actually get in front of a customer and you can show a demo of that thing that you and the engineers brought together, yeah, yeah, you yeah. get that. And many of them go on to be future general managers and CEOs. Yeah. So I think that, that, that that's really, you know, often I think the folks who've just come from a marketing perspective but don't have that deep yeah. engineering roots yeah. take a lot, a little longer to relate to the engineering teams, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. a little longer to kind of detect innovation. But some of them are also successful. I'm not at all no, no, putting no, no, them but, down. But oftentimes but I, you see companies like Google where you have a lot of software engineers in there but very few good general managers or product yeah. managers, and it, it can impede the sort of evolution of software yeah. quite quickly. Cause in the early days it comes fluidly. Yeah, you really need it. And I'm obviously talking a lot about the product manager, but let's not forget, right? The part of the the genius of innovation here are great engineers. So I mean, I think you can't. <laughs> That's what do we anything. think. Yeah, it's, it's, it, you have to have that group. Uh, and you know, obviously, it's just great that you got institutions like Carnegie Mellon and many others that are producing fantastic computer scientists. Um, and it's great that you're in the Silicon Valley because I mean, you. I mean, I mean forget the the weather is probably the best part of this area, but. I mean, think about the um, number of opportunities you have up and down either 101 or 280 to explore <clears throat> in terms of things that you could do, the number of great companies from HP to, um, to semiconductor companies to Intel to Apple to now Google and Facebook and VMware and Salesforce and even SAP, a German company, decided they had to do something yeah, here, yeah. create a Silicon Valley. I think it's just awesome. So yeah. I, I think it's a great move that you guys have a campus here.
Thank you. We, I, I think a little warmer than Pittsburgh, right? Just a little. Okay. And our students, when we're in, when, when when we're teaching, and it's eleven, you know, ten o'clock at night in Pittsburgh, and they got to go walk home in ten degrees <laughs> below. It's kind of it's less than enthusiastic, but we we make it work. But it's you know it's really interesting what you say about this kind of innovation in the valley right now, and 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 the ability to have new companies coming along. But you know, you were at SAP and you worked in the analytics area, and SAP was regenerated by Hannah, which you must have been heavily involved in. So it shows not only can new companies come along with innovation, but existing companies, which is what you're doing at VMware right now, can also transform themselves with innovations too. Yeah, I think the story of Hanna is just an absolute incredible story. Jens is here with me. He was also very involved uh, with that. Um, I mean, it really was the brainchild of uh, Paso Platna, our chairman, uh, who is, I mean, I think you beat him. You think about the number of people who are in their 70s who are just, you know, just passionate about technology and can't give it up. I mean, there's a few of them. Larry Ellison's one of them. Yeah, Asa Plata is one of them. They just have a passion. I, for, first off, you know, I mean, given the fact my dad's my son, I mean, just having people who are at that age and still passionate about technology for one is just blows my mind away. But he's had this sort of perspective that, you know, uh, in memory databases, we're going to have a monumental, you know, disruptive innovation in traditional databases. Yeah. And you, you know, couple that with the price of uh, memory falling. Uh, you know everything from solid solid state to you know all of the the aspects of you know physical RAM, uh, columnar databases were now something that you could actually make possible uh, for both both sort of you know analytical problems and transactional problems. You yeah. put that all together. Yeah. He'd been sort of thinking through this for a while, and then had a really uh, great sort of you know leader in Vishal, who was the key person, yeah. was able to make it happen. So um, I just was really really fortunate to work in that system. To actually, you know, be involved in taking that to market. Uh, so my role in that was running a team uh, that was involved in actually driving the solution sales success of it. Mm -hmm. uh, we put some really, really talented people on that problem, yeah. um, and it really started to explode. And I think, you know, the same. This is classic Clay Christensen. You know, for those of you who read the book called this Innovator's Dilemma, um, the best type of innovation you could have is not something that's sort of evolutionary. But something that's a step function or disruptive, yeah. because <clears throat> you get to play David and Goliath, right? Yeah. Here's the Goliath, and here's kind of how you're going to try and disrupt them. And it's a fascinating, great yeah. story. We were doing that against the traditional database companies, mm -hmm. primarily Oracle. And that's you know kind of been the rejuvenation, the last probably four years of SAP's story now being yep. you know kind of more Hana driven. And that's you know yeah. similar to some of the things we're, we'll talk about what we're doing at VMware. But being involved in that was just a really, really great uh, learning experience. That, 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 I was leaning on that because I wanted to lead up to what you're doing at VMware as an overview. And then I'd like to encourage people to sort of talk and ask questions because it's interesting. At, when you joined VMware, <coughs> you kind of pretty quickly made the biggest acquisition in the history of VMware. Did, did, when, you, when you came to VMware, did you see a, a strong need for that mobile kind of space to kind of uh, take in, 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 in the way the enterprises were starting to move too? Because it was really before the whole bring your own device and all this kind of openness came about. So it was a pretty you know, important thing to do. I think when, uh, when Pat Gelsinger, who was our CEO and my boss, by the way, who's built a fantastic team. I mean, all of these companies, I've just been fortunate to work with great leaders. Uh, I mentioned Hasso Platten and Vishal. Bill McDermott well, is CEO. Well, Matt, you there too. No, I, actually, yeah, he may have been actually, uh, he came after me. Well, I didn't know, I mean, before he was there, I didn't know him. Uh, Jeff Rakes was the head of our uh, division. Uh, but, you know, you know, having seen and worked with some of these great leaders, so Bill McDermott at, at SAP and then... Um, um, yeah, you know, somebody's uh, going to come up with an innovation on these. To actually help this? I'll just put it here. That's all right. Uh, you know, uh, or John Thompson at Symantec. I just learned a lot from these leaders. But uh, in the context of, of, of VMware, as Pat Gelsinger and Joe Tucci, as our chairman, were talking to me, it was very clear that if you really want to revolutionize the experience of an end user uh, and their computing, a big part of their life is the desktop or a laptop. So you look at this machine there, it's a desktop. Uh, you know, in the past, if you did this meeting, you see one person here, he's got a laptop. But the bulk of you here, how many of you have a smartphone? Everybody, yeah, right? Yeah. If I asked the same question probably five years ago, nobody would raise their hand, or maybe a few. If you had a Blackberry, maybe. Um, so the way in which our computing has changed has completely been transformed by the notion of thinner and thinner client computing. Uh, so whether it's a tablet or a phone or a machine, if you think about a car, a Tesla or a BMW, there's more software today in the modern car than the first 1970 spacecraft, right? So your car is really a mini computer 
or a big phone, whatever you want to have you, vendor, right? So, Stuff you know, like. in any of those environments, you know, part of what we do well at VMware, the V stands for virtualization, is really abstract away a lot of the complexity or things that you would need to do physically and put that into some kind of virtual environment. The simple principle of virtualization, if I was describing this to my mother, is you've got lots of half-empty glasses of water. Instead of keeping all those half-empty glasses of water, you pour it into one big jug and you pour out as you need. That's, in fact, what you're doing with servers, right? You just sort of dispense it as you need. Yeah. So virtualization on the client is very similar. If you can abstract away and just have a very, very thin client experience, you don't have to physically install anything on that laptop or desktop. Um, and you can then sort of take this like one painted glass. You start off on a desktop, yeah. you open up a laptop, and then you bring up your tablet or your phone or you get into your Tesla. All of your apps and your content, your data is just served up to you, right? If you think yeah. about your life today, listening to music. How many of you lug around CDs, right? Or a bag of CDs, like we did like 10, 15 years ago. You're like, are you kidding me? If you saw somebody did that, you're like, are you yeah, from, we'll, have you we'll missed out it. iCloud? We'll have you missed it. out iPod? I mean, what's been happening, right? All your songs are in the cloud. And DVDs also, I mean, you know, Netflix is probably transforming. Yes, you can rent DVDs, but you're probably gonna stream it a lot more, right? Or watch it on YouTube. So I think that same experience as it enters the business world means that, you know, if you're watching Netflix, you, you know, let's say whatever, watching House of Cards, you start the movie in uh, your home, you get on a plane, you go to Barcelona, you start exactly where you stop. Your business life should be exactly the same way. You shouldn't have to lug around a laptop. You just kind of get yeah, all yeah. your stuff served <clears> up to you, right? And increasingly, a big part of that was mobile. Yeah. And that's why we felt we had to do something mobile. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, let, let's circle back to that in just a while. So I want to pick up on, on something you just said, because we do a lot of work with CIOs, and the enterprise is, is your big market. And many of them, spend 70% of their budget on legacy systems, uh, on-prem stuff that's still there, the Bank of America is all on-prem, uh, and, and the CIOs are caught in this kind of dilemma where they have to keep the lights on, but they've also got to innovate. Now, they must be your customer base, and they're really approaching this kind of crisis point right now, where they've got to take that leap into the, what they feel is the unknown, because they've got to explain it to their CFO or the CEO, and for me, they're going to do this. And yet many of them are reticent to innovate. You, you kind of feel that sort of, you know, let, let's just wait and see how it's going to work out. And one of the things that's really apparent is that the way that social has hit all the mobile media and, 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 and stuff hasn't kind of worked inside the enterprise yet. And I'm really interested to sort of see your views on, on, on enterprise innovation and what are some of the kind of obstacles and pain points and how you could probably free this up and make it more fluid for CIOs to make that kind of transition. I think it's a really good point. I mean. I'll tell you, one of the things that we really wrestled with at SAP was how do you make our applications more consumer friendly? Because one of the things that's really at the tension point of yin and yang is more functionality in any software makes it more complex, right? And, and as you add more functionality, it just sort of becomes the enemy of simplicity. And SAP is probably the most, most functional software. And when you start adding more functionality, invariably you start kind of breaking the other axis, which is simplicity. Yep. Uh, and you, you know, today in a consumer-centric uh, economy, a 22-year-old who's come out of college says, you know, hey, listen, I'm used to using Google Mail or Facebook. I expect my business applications to be as simple as that. Or are you kidding me? Uh, you know, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna, you know, not use it or whatever, right? So, you know, um, we, we, you know, I think has as, a, as an enterprise world and a business world have to take a lot of lessons out of the consumer side because. There's one thing that in enterprise companies do very well is things like control and yeah. security, things of that kind. We got that down in spades. Yeah. I mean, you want any kind of control or security, the enterprise companies can do better than anybody else. The one thing we don't do well enough is simplicity and, yeah. and ease of use and consumer-grade user experiences. So I think we could take a page out of the book of the Googles, the Facebooks, uh, the Twitters, and ask ourselves, what's the ways by which we could make our consumer experiences inside enterprise apps? And that's really been a key part uh, one of the things that, uh, you know, chairman of my former company, uh, SAP, you know, kind of drove uh, in the design school that's kind of co-done with, 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 uh, with Stanford is the whole idea of design thinking, which is in essence, you know, you think about whether an idea is, you know, uh, feasible, viable, and so on and so forth. Yeah. And you, in essence, build it in very close concert with a customer um, so that you're really tailor-fitting it for the needs of those customers. You're asking all the why, uh, the what, uh, and then finally you get to the how questions, right? So, you know, if there's one, you know, passion that we really have 
um, it, it's really to kind of inaugurate end user computing. Yeah. It's to make these experiences delicious for the end user. Yeah. It has to be something that's simple, easy to use. Yeah. And we're not quite, you're never quite there. <laughs> because you look at this, you're like, man, wow, it's not quite there. It's still, <laughs> you know, you put it in front yeah. of a user and they find it hard to use. Yeah. And you're, that's the one thing if you, if, you know, we could go to all enterprise software and make it simpler, 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 you'll be enormously successful. Well, you see the success of Dropbox and Boxing and the same kind of, kind of concept. But it actually goes back to something you said earlier about the product manager. You know, the product manager needs that design approach to get the customer's input in. But in the enterprise, the customers are sort of spread out. The CIO is the obvious choice, but in, in the, in, not in the valley, but in, in bigger companies. And, you know, they see the move to hybrid clouds as something that they really want to do. They see the move to <coughs> uh, software-defined networking, which your acquisition in Nacera has really put VMware in a very strong position. And they see the kind of world changing. And some CIOs kind of see that as an opportunity and they do a great job. Others are kind of not so good and, a, and, a, and, a, and it's a kind of problem. And it's a $2 trillion spend out there. It's a big kind of market. And the consumerization of IT has, has really caused, uh, like, you know, you're talking about security. I mean, most enterprises had a, a wall around them and a, and a moat and a drawbridge. And the only way to get in was through the, through the drawbridge. Now it's just gone away. And, and, and so do you see many of the customers coming to you to help them kind of in a partnership role transform their organizations. I mean, I want to talk about innovation inside the enterprises. You know, you drive in the major innovations right now. Uh, absolutely. I think some of our best relationships with customers are one where they, they're not a vendor. I mean, you know, we're not selling them software, but they're co-innovators with us. So I'm always often looking for CIOs and CTOs and visionaries within the company who say, listen, we see in you vision uh, and we're, we're going to buy software, obviously, from you, but we're also going to sit on your neck, okay, yeah. to help you make your software better. And you love customers like that, who are willing to just, you know, kind of dedicate time. Because that's how you, I mean, you think about the innovation you guys do, uh, or, you know, Carnegie Mellon, or any, you know, things that you do, whether it's, whether it's robots, or when you have that sort of customer perspective that's right next to you, you get that experience of that engineer and product manager decides, hey, print preview is what you want. Okay, got it. I'll, I'll build it. So uh, we are look. We always look for enterprise customers who have that vision, who are willing to kind of drive and guide. And I'll tell you, you know, we do things like advisory boards where we have 15 or 20 customers, who are you know a mixture of uh, big customers and small customers, mixture of customers in various different verticals. And uh, those sessions, I mean, I can sit through days of them. Mm -hmm. uh, I love to be in front of customers a lot because when you hear what a customer is trying to get done, and when they give you a critique. And a willing product manager and engineer is trying to iterate on that. I will tell you, you build beautiful software. Yeah. And all of these great <clears> companies <throat> you pointed out, whether it's you know Google or Facebook or Dropbox or whatever, that's their mindset. They're always looking yeah. for ways to listen to the customer, yeah. and they have a mindset that the customer is always right. I'll, I won't forget an article I read in Fortune about some of the great management principles of Jeff Bezos at Amazon. Um, that talked. The article talked about how in his management meeting. Um, he has an empty chair, and at in that chair, it's always empty. He says, "In that chair sits the customer." Okay, and it's an obsession. So if there's a debate, so ask, what would that person say, right? And I think that mindset has to be just something that you know it's it's trite. Everybody says it, but you really have to build this into your kind of your core DNA. Yeah, um, that, that the customer is always right. If a customer sends you an email, you're going to respond within 24 hours, right? And often we, as you know, engineers or product managers, you know, we get to the point, especially in enterprise, you're like, oh, man, that darn yeah, customer, again, again. did they have to complain <laughs> again? Do I have to fix this code again? <laughs> no, Why can't they just go away, right? <laughs> so you get to that mode, but if you can solve through this, that. you can find many of those customers who are ranting, their rants will turn to raves, right, if you're just willing to persist with it. So, um, uh, you know, that's, I think, the promise of being able to work with, uh, with you know, innovative But for, 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 for software engineers, they usually kind of, CMU software engineers are probably excluded from this, but they're kind of introverted and they like coding. And oftentimes, the last thing that they want to do is to talk to a customer. They just want to keep keep it tidy. What kind of advice would you give for a, for an aspiring master student to, to, to doing say software engineering to get to get more involved in that? How, how would you go about that process? I mean, I think that listen, clearly the personality type, introvert, extrovert, you know, can make. But you know, I think the, first, the most important thing that all of us need. You need to do a lot when we're doing dealing with the customer in sort of two years, one month, right? You're listening. You're trying to listen. Yeah. You're trying to ask the right question. 
So I actually find often some of the introverted folks are less quick to jump on a point of view. Um, they ask the right questions, they listen. So I actually think it's not a negative. If you're an introvert, you're probably likely to listen a little better. Instead. You know, rather than speak. <laughs> yeah. And often the extroverted person is going to probably jump to the conclusion when they probably should have just asked a question. I think the most important thing we seek to do, all of us, you know, who, uh, is just ask more questions of customers. I always find when I'm sitting in a room, in a conference room, you know, you're discussing something. It could be either with the customer or something else. The, the, you, the, the people who are the most insightful that I learn from are the people who ask just the right question, mm -hmm. where when they ask the question, like, dang, that was such a good question. Why didn't I ask it? Because they're asking a question that elicited information. Right? And it's usually quite simple. It's and you know the difference? I mean, I've got a seven-year-old girl and I've got twin four-year-old boys. The difference between adults and kids is kids tend to ask open-ended questions. Why? Uh, you know, how? And they just, they, they just ask questions. And we tend to be closed-end questions, you know, which are basically, this is how we will do it, right? So you're almost assuming you get, that you get a one. You get I mean, a like, one. What's the answer? This is how you'll do it, right? Kind of well, I mean, what, you, what are you supposed to say when this is how we're going to do it? So all of us, and me included. I mean, this is you know as much looking in the mirror as, as as you know. We with customers, I I encourage our product managers, our engineers to ask more open-ended questions rather than, and from that you'll just find that as you're asking those questions, things come out. Yeah, absolutely. So introvert, extrovert, there is no disadvantage. <clears throat> That's a great way of putting it around. But I would like the audience to ask questions if they have any questions. But I'm I'm, I'm still fascinated by the, C the CIO business because we're seeing that, that kind of stack change. I mean, we've gone from batch to interactive, and now we're in real time. And this, the number of people that are, are, are interacting with a corporation is, is just magnified beyond all proportion. And every enterprise is trying to figure out how do we migrate, how how do we you know get into Hadoop? How do we provision clusters? How do we get into mobile? How do we kind of figure out how to use our data centers more effectively? How do we kind of interact with our customers better? It's it's not a one-shot kind of deal. There's a lot of things going on. So how do you work with a customer to educate that customer on, on what they can possibly do? And you must, you must be getting a lot of credit for kind of making companies much more efficient and effective. I mean, I think that, you know, while I said it's important to listen, sometimes you also, I mean, my personal opinion, I think if Steve Jobs is alive and sitting here, uh, you'd probably agree. But I, you know, if Steve Jobs had just listened to a customer, he probably wouldn't have built an iPhone. Right. He would have bought, built a better BlackBerry. Okay. With keyboards and you know, in fact, he joked about yeah, when he yeah, when he, he launched the iPhone. Customer, yeah. He said, "Here's the iPhone. It had like a knob on it because that's the way in which you were supposed to make the phone call, right? Because you'd have had a rope." So I think there's an element of an innovator um, that's listening, but then leading. You're saying, okay, listen, the yeah. customer doesn't know that really what they want here is pinch and zoom because that could transform the experience of just, yeah. you know, typing and the yeah. apps are much more experienced than just the keyboard experience that are, are Blackberries. I'm just sort of thinking of what went in the mind of, of uh, Jobs and all of his great people, Johnny Ive and all that, in designing a phone to an iPad. And then Hoffman was the MU crowd, that was the same. I said, well, you know, more kudos. I wish I'd gone there. <laughs> but, you know, that, nonetheless. We'll make you an honorary member, don't uh, worry. That, you know, anytime you want me to speak at your graduation, <laughs> so I get the, I get the, I get the, the honorary PhD. There you, know, you my go. Mom, my mom will be enormously happy. But, uh, you know, I think that that, that is how I think, you know, the, the, I think the great uh, innovators of our time, you know, whether it's yeah. Tesla, whether it's Thomas Edison, whether it's you know, Steve Jobs, anybody that we admire as great leaders that, you know, I revere, because they are rare. I mean, I just look at them with a lot of, you know, how did they make that happen? There's an element clearly of listening, because they're listening to a lot of what's going on, but then there's also an element of leading. Yes. And you need a, an element, you need both of those, because, you know, if you just listen, you may get off onto a wrong track. But the ones who are listening and leading, you get something that's... But do you think that's one of the reasons why there are so many kind of really successful entrepreneurial companies in the Valley? Because they're really engineers who can innovate, but they can also lead, and because they have their oh, yeah. own... That's why big enterprises aren't as innovative. That's, that's, that's one of the problems that... that, that I mean, you just get that. a lot more caught up, I think, in bigger companies, which is just, I mean, VMware is a big company, too. And we have to fight being bureaucratic, right? I mean, what creates bureaucracy? Layers upon yeah. layers upon layers. Managers. Good size. Right? Yeah. And, you know, because, you know, and th you can't have 16,000 people of VMware who's that size reporting to a CEO. That just doesn't yeah. work, right? It yeah. can't be all flat. So you have to have the appropriate... But you have to, you know, kind of really understand that the hierarchy doesn't mean that you've got to, that engenders respect. 
or it engenders incompetence. The most important people might yeah. be people to lead for the organization. Yeah. And as a leader, certainly, you know, as a general manager or somebody, you know, running a large organization, my goal has always been to, you know, even if it's skip levels, to understand who are those individual contributors or middle managers yeah. who are really making it happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Well, and build your yeah. circle around them so that you can dive into talking to them. Because the more that you just rely on the people reporting to you, not yeah. to say that that's wrong, yeah, no. you sometimes get a warped sense of what it is, right? Yeah. Well, because they tell you what they think you want to hear. Yeah, so I think the more that you can build, and you know, I think the greatest leaders, even Jobs, you'd find them routinely, the stories of Jobs would be walking around cubes and picking the random engineer. Uh, and he'd have often, apparently, the stories at, at Apple were he'd have you know, um, his you know, normal staff meeting in the morning, but the afternoon, were topical meetings on something, and he just, I mean, he would assemble the group of people who were going to be, and it had nothing to do with an org chart. Mm -hmm. It could be this engineer, this product manager, this person, because it was the five, ten people that yeah. were really critical to the making of whatever, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, you know, he's talked a lot about it if you love watch this. So I think those are the types of things that we can emulate um, um, to keep that fostering spirit of innovation moving. But you've injected a, a, a fairly dramatic shift inside of VMware by doing the acquisition and working on the mobile and consumer space, how does that fit with the old sort of enterprise orientation where, you know, saving money by using all of your servers and things was, was well, uh, easy to... Well, you know, I mean, first off, uh, the, the, the roots of the company is just, you know, bred in innovation. Uh, you know, Dan well, Green, Dian, Green, Green and the, you know, the, the, the group of engineers from Stanford who started, we hire a lot from Carnegie Mellon, we have a tremendous respect for that computer science, is a deep, uh, you know, kind of kernel level, system engineering level problem, the operating system level that's, you know, hard to solve. Right. I mean, virtualization is, it's, yeah. just, it's hard stuff. And, you know, companies have not got it right. Uh, we've run at a very high quality. Our, our customer satisfaction levels, our core serve, serve virtualization, are some of the highest in the industry. A lot of people build mm -hmm. buggy product in the enterprise. So the probably the most celebrated people at VMware are the Rockstar engineers, our fellows. I mean, that. The, the developer conference uh, events, the kickoffs are some of the... So it starts with the fact that, you know, that group, it's a product-centric company. Um, and from that, we then ask ourselves, okay, listen, the most celebrated innovation is always something that you can build organically. Acquisitions are more expensive. Mm -hmm. They cost more to integrate. So let's start off saying if we're going to innovate, we're going to start by innovating organically. Now, if you can't, you then have to ask yourself, listen, Let's acquire to move faster into the market, but acquire a company that has similar innovation values. Mm -hmm. So when you put the two together, and that's what we found in AirWatch. Right? We were late to the market. You know, the market was moving fast. It was an innovative company that didn't happen in the Silicon Valley. Now, you know, I'm going to say this with a little bit of, you know, not that the Silicon Valley isn't great, but one of the detriments of the Silicon Valley is it tends to be a feeding frenzy on each other's talent. So, you know, great company starts, and then another company starts down the road saying, yeah. wow, that company's good. Let me hire a lot of VMware engineers, <laughs> right? And we start losing people. We've seen so, that in the hybrid cloud area. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of this happening that where, so we actually felt that, you know, almost ironic and contrary to, to common belief that having a company that was headquartered in Atlanta, which is where I watch was, yeah. was a benefit to us because there's not going to be as much yeah. poaching and, you know. And they are one of the uh, technology darlings in the Atlanta area. They've also got a sizable team in Bangalore, which is close to us. So all that led to the... Uh, the business case and the thesis to say this is the company we acquire, and we announce that in January. And is, is the integration process going ahead? I mean, are you keeping the software? It's six software months. Software? We've decided to keep the unit intact. I learned a lot, too. A lot of scars in my back, uh, being involved with four or five acquisitions. Uh, one or two that I was very involved in, in running key parts of business yeah. objects and Sybase. Yeah. So I learned a lot about what you do and what you don't do in that, mm -hmm. um, how you bring a mix of both cultures, how do you really keep that innovation. So we kept it under intact under... Uh, the CEO of that business, uh, John Marshall, who's a really innovative, uh, you know, um, uh, entrepreneur out of Georgia Tech, um, and you know, sort of each, you know, part of the world has different. These guys just hired, you know, yeah. engineers out of <coughs> Georgia Tech, and put them to work. Yeah. Average age there is like 28 or 29, yeah. and the way they designed their their uh, their um, uh, campus was was really fascinating. They bought the uh, the you know the southern company, the trading floor of this, you know, utilities and you know, exchange, and they put 400 engineers in there. No offices, that's all cubicles, right next to each other because they feel like it has to happen all together. Uh, and in that, you just get lots of, and if you need to have a private conversation, you go into a small little room to do that. 
So I think there are ways in which you can kind of foster that in, in larger settings too, which yeah, I, we yeah. respect. Yeah, what yeah no, no, absolutely. I, that, that, that's an interesting analogy. As a friend of mine has mentioned, Capra said, you know, the way innovation occurs is when you put half a dozen really smart people in a room, you just lock the door and let them go yeah. and, and, and let them at it. And you can't do that in a, in a, in a bigger company. But in, in a sense, the, the, the acquisition route is it, one of the most common exits. Public offerings don't happen. Maybe one in 10 go public and eight out of 10 get acquired. And, and it's part of the Valley's way of absorbing and reinventing and things like that. And given the size of VMware right now, that there's a kind of reinvention going on that you, you, you're part of as you see this move from virtualization to zero latency uh, computing, that there, there are some issues involved in, in, in that migration and it's causing companies like Databricks up in, in Berkeley to come out with alternative kind of stack architectures that look kind of interesting. They, 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 they absorb machine learning and visualization and stuff like that. Do you see a lot of competition come from, from startup companies? I mean, listen, that's always, I mean, you know, for us when we acquired Nicira, a very different type of case, the second largest acquisition. Mm -hmm. But, you know, with them, both Stanford, Berkeley, and I think there was also some going to Carnegie Mellon, the yeah. whole drive of software-defined networking yeah. was really going to disrupt the traditional hardware networking stack. Absolutely. Uh, now it was a very different case because it was a smaller team with lots of potential value disrupting even bigger markets. So, yeah. uh, well, that's Nicer was one of those type of companies, right? Yeah. Was <clears> doing <throat> a lot of stuff with OpenStack, and yeah. and we found this, you know, okay, this was going to really rejuvenate. So, you know, again, I say the most important thing you have to start with is you cannot acquire your way out of trouble. So the most important thing is that you've got to foster a culture of organic innovation. If you don't start there. You'll end up like these companies that have just cobbled. You see, I'm not going to name them because they are no, no, but respected it's, it's companies, but there are companies today who've made their entire strategy just acquisitions. Well, the company you've been right. against to get Nasira is, is a great example of that, but it, it, it's a real problem. Yeah, exactly. Because right. the inertia hits in, entropy hits in. So you've got to organically start first with innovation. And the bulk of what we do at VMware is organic innovation. But then when you look at points in place where you're sort of like Swiss cheese, you have a hole there, okay, yeah. or you see an opportunity, you have to ask yourself, what's the best path? Build? Partner or buy. Right? Yeah. You're thinking through each of those three possibilities. Yeah, please. So you know, yeah. Could you Go press ahead. the microphone if you don't mind, so the people are. Uh, is a little button in front of it. The button. I'm stuck in the wire. That, then I guess I guess the people on the audio yeah. can hear you. Um, so like you were talking about Cisco. Uh, so so I'm a GM. <laughs> I'm a GM at Cisco of a uh, cloud startup, and so putting on your kind of SVP, EVP hat, I find myself in this situation where most of the SVPs who are my stakeholders are hardware jocks. They're not at all familiar with kind of cloud startups, and the challenge is to help them understand at the end of year one, year two, what are some of the reasonable customer excuse me, customer or business milestones we should be shooting for that aren't necessarily related to top line revenue. Because, you know, they may be familiar with a hardware model that says, hey, you know, pop out a new router, it's $100 million tomorrow. Whereas when you're in an as-a-service model, it's going to take a lot longer to grow. So setting aside kind of top line, you know, you were mentioning CIOs and things like that. What would be maybe one or two things you'd be looking for you know, my name's Bob. Bob, at the end of year one, at the end of year two, these would be some of the things that would tell us directionally we're establishing this new category. We may be challenged to figure out what the ramp is, but we're on the right track. Yeah. That's a really great good question. question. That's a fantastic question because therein lies, you yeah. know, if you can solve that, you can write books, you'll be a <laughs> yeah, yeah. venture capitalist, <laughs> and you can retire from Cisco just oh, putting your money everywhere else. Uh, but, you know, in essence, you haven't watched this. In you know, at, at SAP, I, I grew three businesses: analytics, big data, and mobile. At the end of it, there's three billion. I watched them from inception, practically zero. Uh, and for, I mean, companies like Cisco, SAP, VMware, we have a sales force, so it's harder when you're a smaller company mm -hmm. to one, right? So let me kind of cover it within the context of a bigger company, which is where you and I, I live. Um, I think the most important thing is to first off have a very clear understanding as a general manager that you are, or your product managers in your team, that what you're solving has a clear market opportunity, right? Uh, this is the sort of the most important question that venture ca capital are, are asking. Is it, is it viable? Does it have an opportunity here that actually people will pay money for? And you know, the best way you can assess that is with customers you know who are saying, listen, if I solve this 
And I'm always asked, well, well before we begin, we just, you know, we're doing a strategy presentation of an area we're thinking about uh, organically investing or build out today. And the team, as they were preparing for this, you know, spent about 15 or 20 key meetings with senior customers that they almost could sense if they built us, there'd be a purchase order, right? So that was important. Um, uh, the other aspect of it is knowing the competitive landscape and knowing, okay, as you think about this, it's not like you're the only one thinking about it. Even if it's sort of disruptive, what would the competitors likely do? And do we have something that's just incrementally better or leapfrog better? Anything that's leapfrog is always going to be huge, right? But incremental doesn't mean it's bad. You just then have to have a cost of ownership or some kind of feature functionality way in which you're changing the game because everything can't be you know, leapfrog initially. Um, the final thing that I, I encourage teams to do is, you know, it's totally okay if you don't get version one perfect, get it out there. Get it out there in front of those 15 to 20 customers that you bought. And even if them, they don't all pay for it initially, get them giving you feedback so that the next version, I think that if you can get a product out in six months, in today's world, it's not biotech. You shouldn't have to wait six years for this thing, right? <laughs> I mean, if it is, we're in the wrong business, right? I mean, uh, pharmaceutical, that, that, but in this business, we yeah. should be able to get first because you've got, you, know, you don't have to build a lot of the infrastructure. You can do it in the cloud. Uh, We've got a few startups competing with us. We've got our first, you know, 20 customers, mostly right. enterprise customers. They paid a few hundred thousand yeah. for it. What I'm grappling with is, is the scale part. Is the scale yeah. part. Yeah. Is, is at the end of yeah. you know 12 months, should you be on a 50 mil ramp? Should yeah. be a 20 mil. Less? I mean, again, you know, that we could talk offline a lot more the specifics if if it's if it's helpful. But my experience there really is being able to then, uh, you know, really crack this nut of a sales force. You know, because most often. You're inside a big company that's got thousands of sales force that are, I mean, in your case, probably thinking routers and switches all the time. Will they do the next thing? In my case, thinking perhaps data center server virtualization and SAP thinking ERP. So there's a core fabric. And one of the things, you know, that I learned from having run all the specialist teams at SAP is that you really have to have, you know, that nucleus of that specialist sales force that becomes your glue, sorry, your entry point, your on-ramp into the big sales force. Uh, and that's now a different skill now. We're not talking about engineering product management. This is really about go-to-market people. Uh, so these were people that we had and that we, you know, that we cultivated, who could train a few hundred people, who were then on ramps to the few thousand people. Okay, and you'd love to train all thousands of them, but those that core sales force is never going to get. It. They got so much in their bag to learn, right? This is exactly what we're doing. Chef, right? we should exactly talk about this online. Yeah, and we, have, we could go deep on this use case, but, <laughs> yeah. but this is, in essence, you know, what we could all write books about. Well, if you can crack that nut, yeah. I think there's two kinds of entrepreneurship. An entrepreneurship that happens in a small company where you're exploding on your own okay, and you're trying to find some channel. And there's entrepreneurship, which is basically doing that same thing within a big company. Both are equally bad. I think we pay a lot of attention to the entrepreneurs mm -hmm. outside. But being an entrepreneur inside a big company you can get a faster ramp to 100 million inside a big company. You can get that. Well, that's what happened with Hannah and SAP. Yeah. 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 And that's what we're, you know, hopefully going to been doing. And in this computer is going to even do more. Uh, today, we're the fastest growing business uh, within the company. And we, the more that you fuel that, you get the flywheel going. Yeah. And I'll tell you, it's a beautiful thing when that flywheel is really fun. Because actually, when you get that at critical mass, you can yeah. actually dispense yeah. off that special sales force. The core team just takes over. And one of the things that's oftentimes difficult for big companies to work with startups is the clock speed is much faster in a, in a startup than it is in a, in a larger enterprise. And many have a difficult uh, job kind of interfacing. But if, if you can unleash that in a, a big company with the resources, then you can really get to yeah. scale a lot, a lot quicker. And that's what venture capital is trying to do is to scale that way. I know we got another question over here from Krishna. Sanjay, uh, do you see that uh, this is a tremendous disruption happening in the education space? And you also spoke about the industry prices getting disrupted, uh, but there is still a gap of worth trying to do it because if the enterprises are looking at the vendors to help, often there are different considerations and solution may or may not be the right one. Uh, so there is a gap, both are trying to do their, uh, meet somewhere in between to get the solution, but it's not going through. The, the challenge is not something like we were speaking with the airline industry out of the Middle East. What it comes back and telling us that uh, uh, the challenge is managing the flight channels, our disruption. The aircrafts are revolving in India and Middle East. You know how much fuel and time is wasted up in the air. It's not helping anyone, neither the bottom lines nor the customer satisfaction. But those are such big challenges. Uh, you mentioned about the small area, 100 million. There's like maybe billion or yeah, sure. That's that's kind of getting lost in this. And we're getting better phone sharing apps and such other things. 
we still watch each other really coming through. And we talk so many larger issues. Of yeah, no, I think, listen, uh, you know, we are in a world which is very, in the Silicon Valley, um, you know, driven by many of the things that we see in consumer uh, applications like Facebook and Google and Twitter. And we often forget that sort of the, the mainstream part of, you know, uh, companies that run logistics uh, and so on and so forth of the world, whether it's airlines and so on and so forth, have, you know, complex problems uh, to solve. I do fundamentally believe, though, that, you know, technology and, and smart folks uh, can transform any industry. Okay? And, and, you know, I'll give you a couple examples. And I'm sure that Southwest Airlines is, I mean, I don't know which airline you're talking about, but if you take them, it's, it's different. But the fundamental genius of Southwest Airlines uh, and it's slow. not like they do everything right, but they said, hey, listen, we're going to do a few things and do them really well. For one, we're only going to fly one kind of plane. Do you know what plane they fly? 737. It's the only plane. I don't know if they've changed them, but so far I haven't seen a non-737 South, Southwest airline. And then they decided, listen, the most important thing that customers care about is uh, on time. They don't care about when it leaves. Okay? You don't mind if it's late. You just want it to arrive on time. Okay? <laughs> and you want your bags never to be lost. Okay? So arrivals and like bag handling is the most important stuff. So they said, listen, irrespective of when a plane gets in, we're going to guarantee that we can get people you know, on and off the plane within 25 minutes or 15 minutes. And they kind of focused on that cycle time uh, of people off the plane. And then they just do some creative things. Hey, there's no cleaning staff. The flight attendant's supposed to clean the plane. Okay? It's part of the job description. Maybe they pay you a little extra money or whatever have you. But it's like you know, the pilots will help. And they build that into their culture where customer service becomes such a nice part of a short flight. Hey, you know what? We're not going to serve food, but let's just invest in leather seats. Uh, maybe get internet on the plane. Okay, And then you know, people will buy their food when they come on place. So let's make the flight experience one where the flight attendants like sing the, uh, the, uh, the instructions or whatever have you. Right? So things of that kind, I think, transform that. They're actually one of the more profitable uh, so I think this is you know sort of the same thing of design think. I actually think the same principles of a smart person thinking um, like a product manager or thinking how do I design uh, thinking why solve this problem can solve through any type of problem whether it's a Facebook type of problem or um, you know something that's you know in an, in an airline industry and then you map it with technology right um, you know mobility how is that changing yeah. uh, aircraft Everything that used to be paper bound now needs to be electronic. Okay, Any, everyone see these like 35 pound bags that the uh, pilots drag into the into the cockpit. I mean, it's not just you know uh, bad for fuel. It. No, it's all it. You know, it could break their back. It's like pretty heavy. I mean, this should all be on an iPad, and yeah. that's what AirWatch is doing now. If you go to the Apple, um, uh, you know, website, you'll see a case study of how United Airlines now has. Uh, iPads with all of that stuff powered by AirWatch, you know, inside our contents locker, uh, and that transforms the cockpit. Okay, let's think about the flight attendant. Um, wouldn't it be great if the flight attendant knew exactly that seat 3B or 16A is this person who has this food preference? The data is all there. Could be shown into her iPad, his or her iPad, and as they walk in, they know everything about that passenger, right? Uh, the person who's down when they land on the on the in, in the uh, at the airline terminal, the person who's servicing the plane should have all of the repair capabilities on a mobile device so that their field service of it is fully automated, maybe diagrams that walk them through how to do it. So there, there are ways in which I think fundamentally when you think through all the ways in which technology could transform an industry, I think we're living at this incredible <clears> time <throat> where the combination of cloud computing, mobile are just going to transform any process. It's almost like we're going through an industrial revolution without knowing it. Now, I mean, I, I think the the power of transformation is is pretty. The airlines are a, a good example. Are you, you could I can stay a little longer. Oh, that would be great. Yeah, okay, yeah. good because uh, you know this is fascinating because you, you, we talk yeah. about the airlines and how they're changing. Every company is changing yeah. because it can connect directly with its yeah. customers and yeah. they can do it vice versa too. Yeah. And that's creating a lot of a lot of innovation yeah. in ways that people didn't realize because yeah. many to many communications never been possible. Yeah. Now we can do it. Yeah. And and so it's opening up new ways so the airlines are reorganizing. How do you kind of organize organic innovation inside a company like VMware to look around at that changing landscape and prioritize where you target to 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 I mean to to really make a difference? 
I mean, again, you know, we talked about some of these things. You focus mm -hmm. on, you know, a couple of C's. The customer is one, you know, sure, uh, sure, the, sure. The, the competition. But in, in terms, do you have like an innovation group? Do you have a separate group doing that? Do you, no, I, mean, I think how, it really needs to be. I mean, we have folks who are, you know, CTOs and, and chief strategy folks, but I really like to make that part of the job of a product team. I mean, the more that you separate that out, mm -hmm. you get sort of the sense of the, here are the thinkers and here are the doers. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. Everyone's got to be thinking. So I, you know, even with something like competitive intelligence, people are like, hey, you know, I need to have a special group for studying the company landscape. I said, no, if you're a product manager, you think if you were it. building a BMW and you're like, well, I kind of don't know what the, yeah. the Daimler looks like, or the, I've never driven those. You've got to be you know, knowing what the market is. Why should you expect somebody else to tell you that, right? So we make certain fundamentals part of the core of all of our product teams. Now, there are certain teams who will help them do that, but knowing the customer, Knowing the the comp uh, co the competition and having a competence in your space. I talk yeah, about yeah, three yeah. C's. Okay. Uh, competence is all about domain. You know, we value people who have tremendous domain, and they could have learned the domain. Doesn't have to be in the industry, but the more that you know your domain, the more you're obviously going to be. The more you know the competition, you're going to be able to navigate with your domain to understand where the white spaces <coughs> are. And mm -hmm. of course, the customer being king, they're going to guide you. Mm -hmm. So you know, we we tend to in our market, we compete with a couple of key players. We have a kind of a laser focus on what we can do yeah. that's differentiated relative to them. Uh, and I think the same exists in every industry. You talk about education. You know, Carnegie Mellon's competing for talent with others. You've got a brand that's sort of stood through the course of time. The more you, you know, you differentiate with the brand, the more you stand out. So, you know, the future Sanjay Poonins will actually get in here, right? <laughs> you know, that's my, but that's the, that's the kind of thing that, that I think that we seek to do. Because when you sell a product to the type of CIO that you talked about, they typically, you know, they don't have a lot of time to listen to you. Yeah. Within probably a 30, 45 minute time frame that you may have in front of them, which you may work a long time to get that audience, yeah. you have to answer a couple of key questions. Why do I need to buy? Uh, why now? And why VMware as opposed to somebody else? Yeah, yeah, or yeah. why SAP or whoever, or why yeah. Cisco? So when you can answer those, why buy? I mean, why now and why, why whoever you are? Mm -hmm. uh, same thing for you. If you're a call in an in educational institution, right? Why buy, meaning why should you invest in an education here? Why would you want to come now, whether it's for a master's or then why mm -hmm. CMU? Yeah. So those, I think, sort of fundamental questions transcend any industry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's interesting to kind of do. The in industry is changing. I mean, well, I was talking to a, a, a friend of mine that's in the startup who is in the third generation of e-commerce. And they were kind of going through this whole kind of movement from SaaS to, to everything as a service. And they were saying that they even saw an evolution where com software companies would pay enterprises to use their software because of the, 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 the spend that they could kind of work with and, and, and do that. Now, you've, you're a big proponent of, of, of everything as a service, IT as a service, and things like that. Do you see that kind of eventuality coming? I mean, we... I think, you know, sort of the eventual form of all of that is cloud computing. And, you know, Pat Kelsey, our CEO, has really driven that as a key initiative to everything we're doing. Certainly in our group, we want to drive everything to be cloud computing first. In fact, I tell our teams, build it with a cloud mindset first mm -hmm. and then on-premise second. Mm -hmm. uh, because if you've got the cloud right, you'll probably get on-premise. It's much harder for companies who have built on-premise yeah, 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 to right. kind of get to it as a service model because they haven't built it to be multi-tenant. They haven't thought about how to do agile development, you right. know, all these kinds of things. So whether it's organically built or inorganically, we actually pride. One of the reasons we liked AirWatch is they were the company that had done sort of mobile in a cloud computing fashion better than anybody else. Okay. So when you prioritize that, you start building a thinking into engineers, which is, listen, build it as a service first. And then, of course, if you need to snapshot the code and now build it as a product, yeah. You can always yeah. do that. But you can't but, go back the other I mean, way. I think we are in an era where cloud computing is here to stay. Uh, and, you know, you'll get the rare bank or, uh, you know, a federal institution, regulated industries that say, listen, I don't trust it because of, you know, Snowden or whatever have you. But even then, once you've gotten to that, if you've started with a cloud computing mindset, your software is probably going to be more nimble, more architected properly yeah, yeah, when yeah. you get to an on premise or an appliance well, and, or whatever. And, 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 and people adapt. I mean, after Snowden. Yeah. There are many companies that are building security kind of style that yeah. sniffs the packets that says, well, you're not going to get it if you get, you know, you're, you're, you're out of yeah. permission. Anymore. Or you build, you know, cloud infrastructures that are country resident yeah. so that you're not having to worry about the data sitting in the, I mean, there's lots of ways that people are designing no. around some of the concerns that, you know, Europe and Asia have about data residing in the U.S. Yeah. 
So, you know, I think that's a wake up call to all of us in the IT industry. Because uh, here, I mean, to me, the shame about that whole situation was here's a junior consultant who had like access to all this stuff. And, you know, he was doing the kinds of things we asked the Chinese not to do. Okay. <laughs> I mean, so, in essence, it's a sort of a black eye to all of us in IT. Uh, yeah. We have to, you know, kind of make sure that we've got real, you know, ways by which we can make every country. I think a lot of the Europeans were a lot less trusting yeah. of many U.S.-based companies after that. Uh, oh, we have to sure. work extra hard. Well, the companies in the Middle East are, are, are yeah. sort of paranoid. Uh, because about VMware has a little bit more of a infrastructure powering other people's clouds. In fact, a lot of European companies were used inside their clouds. Yeah. We're not viewed as just a pure play cloud computing company on our own. We also power other people's clouds. We didn't actually have to face too much of, of that backlash. In fact, in some cases, we actually help people through some of the backlash that's happened yeah, yeah, because yeah. of that. But I think the entire US IT industry has to think through very seriously what's the right way in which we're going to approach security yeah. enterprise yeah. in a global world where there's going to be backlash if, if things yeah. aren't dealt uh, oh, within a, see you're seeing it happen. Yeah, right. Absolutely. Well, it's, it's, we have a question. Take a question here. Yes, sir. Uh, You've forgotten. Think, you used, uh, to be, you used, you used to be yeah, here. You I should know how to use these. Take the wrong button. <laughs> Um, uh, so my name is Ram. I'm a part-time student here. Um, my question to you is, um, have you ever been in a situation where, as you are innovating inside a large company like SAP or VMware, um, the kind of things that the market dynamics are, have changed and, and the product that you are building uh, may not be relevant for the market anymore, oh, yeah. and you have to make that tough call that, okay, uh, we need to... <laughs> You've been doing that today. Product, huh? I'm going <laughs> to turn over the floor to Jens, uh, who's going to answer. So what no. are the yeah. <laughs> criteria for that making that tough call? Yeah. Unfortunately, guys, I have to leave uh, early, so I won't be able to spend a lot of time after this hanging out with you. But Jens, I brought him here because he uh, really has been one of my key right hand uh, uh, product managers and followed me from SAP wow, uh, to awesome. VMware. So he'll be able to give you a lot of insights on some of the things that we've done together. Uh, and he's a very, very talented individual. So I'm Would not going to have him talk all? through all oh, the, the failures that, that we have. But I will tell you that, that no co any company that tells you everything has gone right, is they're, they're lying. It's not true. We have plenty of projects that you know kind of fail. In fact, I, I think that when you go through a failure of a particular uh, project, I mean, I'll tell you that there's probably you know, people who tell you, for, who know me from SAP, that here's a project he was involved in, one, two, three, that didn't go well. And those were for me. The right. scars on my back that I have to learn from, right? And if you don't have that, it does not make you humble and hungry. Uh, so any of the failures that we've got to go through, a product that doesn't fail, sorry, doesn't succeed, the most important thing you can take away from that is, you know, um, a quick learning from that. You can't sit in the yeah. dumps, yeah. okay, where you're like, you know, you got to bounce back up. And so, you know, sort of look yourself in the mirror and say, okay, you know what? That's all right. I failed. It didn't work. You know, in many cases, if I'm the general pay. manager, the buck stops with me. Don't look to deflect blame, okay? Uh, and say, okay, you know what? What could I have done differently? And if there was, you know, absolutely nothing, you say, okay, you know what? Maybe I didn't kind of exit out of that quickly enough. Um, uh, and as a company, I think the most important thing, if you're looking to pivot, I encourage uh, product managers, uh, general managers, to be really candid with customers. Don't string them along. Because uh, the worst thing yeah, you yeah. can do it's like a doctor giving bad advice to a patient, right? Think how criminal it is if you have a doctor who tells them, well, you know, you think the person's actually going to die and you're not giving them the right, you're guiding them. Uh, you'd get sued for that kind of stuff, right? So uh, I think often the best thing we could do, obviously within the constraints of what is practical and, uh, you know, legal and things of that kind, is to have an a honest dialogue with the customer to say, listen, you know, we're changing the roadmap here at the right point in time when you prepared it. Um, uh, of course, if you've not, if you haven't prepared it, you've got to be prepared. But because you'll take a black eye, but I could tell you the number of times where we were candid with them, the customer came back and said, "You know what? I really appreciate the fact that you didn't lead me on. You didn't yeah. ask me to spend <clears throat> a lot of money implementing this project yeah. that you think was going to change, right?" So I encourage our teams listen, and then maybe you've got to do some things right by the customer. For example, sometimes we bought a okay. new product or we built a new product that replaces a failing product. Okay, maybe we got to take care of some of the customers. Who bought this old product that failed? Give them, you know, uh, a, a you know uh, a trade in that's a value it, or maybe even the complete swap. Uh, and you tell you what, those small gestures you go to take care of those customers 
will go a long mm -hmm. way. Uh, the engineers, okay, that fail. I think it's really important on a failed product that the leader of that group does not blame the people. They look, they learn, they move on, and they say, listen, we're going to come back. Because, I mean, you think about the early things that, that Apple did well before the iPhone. Remember the Newton? Yeah. I <clears> mean, <throat> there were failed projects at Apple. But if the people who were involved in that did not learn from that, you probably wouldn't have the iPhone and the iPod and the iPad and many things that probably are coming and going. So, you know, that's something that I, I think we all have to, you know, sort of ingrain into us uh, because, you know, along the way to success, there's hopefully a number of failures, right? And I think, you know, they, 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 they have the saying, right? Uh, uh, success has many parents and failure is an orphan, right? And that's not the mentality that, that we should be creating because I think that will yeah. create a short-sighted culture. No, absolutely. In fact, one of your former uh, professors, Bob Sutton at Stanford as well, the B school, you know, he's, He's talking about companies and how they how they can get get better, how they can create excellence and scale excellence. And he says that most companies are bad, and you go from being bad to good. You know, it's just every company's messed up. There's no perfect company out there. But as you said, the key thing is getting repeatable business from the customer. That's what ensures the longevity of every every company. And how you do that is by satisfying them and and, and not deluding them and, and 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 having them as a partner. And as, as a partner, you've been incredible this evening. You've told us Thank you. many stories that were really highly kind of relevant to all of our engineers, both here and in Pittsburgh. Thank you, Doctor. And I I, you know, I've taken away like three things. One is the resilience. It's not how many times you get knocked down. It's how many times you get back up. Absolutely. That's what really counts because sure. you're going to get knocked down Absolutely. lots of times. That's the name of the game. Yeah. The crucial aspect of listening is so important. And so the only way that you can listen is to ask the right question yeah. and not to sort of spout. And you, I think you put that in, in, in a nutshell tonight. More importantly, you've shown us the enthusiasm you have and the passion that you have for the business, for the people that work for you. And more than anything else, you've elevated the role of a product manager to the point where I think everybody that's in our classes will want to be aspiring product managers. I think that's the way to work in the valley. So on that note, I wanted to thank you very, very much for coming this evening and, and, and spending the time with us. Really appreciate thank it. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you very I think much. Krishna has... Uh, thank you, uh, Sanjay. And, uh, thank you. Let me just get this. Uh, thanks again for joining us. I would also like to thank uh, Yona for arranging and coordinating with VMware. And thanks for coming in. Yes, uh, thank you, Yona. It's very kind. <laughs> yes. Are you sure? Uh, we have small luck. Uh, oh, that's so kind of you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Here. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Another small presence to Dr. Dr. Evans. Oh, it was for you. Oh, thank you. Uh, it's lovely to have you come back. We thank you for all guys. And for me, here's a copy oh, of a book. Thank you so We're much. We're actually rewriting, and I hope you find oh, it of interest. Thank you, Dr. Evans. That's awesome. Well, well thank Do you. Do I get to have you sign this too? Oh, you have already. That's so kind. <laughs> this will go on my shelf. Well, I, I, I know Thank you, you guys. We really, really appreciate you sharing the time. You guys with are doing a great uh, oh. service to the valley. Thank you. you know, do I get to bring my kids here sometime Please to see do. the hangar? And Please the, do. Yeah, right, We'd be more than happy. And, and if you talk about product management while you're here, that would be a bonus. Too. I don't know. If they'll appreciate product <laughs> management, but they'll appreciate the hangar. But uh, it must be lovely to have twins as well. That must be kind of amazing. Yeah, so it's a great learning experience. I mean, it makes you <laughs> humble. It makes you tremendously humble. Because I mean, you know. Uh, I tell one that's it's just a short story. One of the things that you, all of us have to develop is product managers' ability to tell stories. Because mm -hmm. I tell a lot of our, our product managers, we get into this habit of like everything is a PowerPoint presentation, yeah. right? And yeah. you know the thing you, you learn about it. kids is they you got to tell them a story, right? And bedtime yes. stories are not PowerPoints, right? <laughs> so it's got to come from the heart. Has to come from the heart. <laughs> Thank you all very much. <laughs>